Hello and welcome to the last installment of the Student Press Freedom Day training series. This is Using Social Media as a Journalist for Advocacy and I'm Andrew Benson. Student Press Freedom Day is February 24th, so it's just around the corner. Head over to studentpressfreedom.org to learn more. In, this, in the chat, you'll find a link to 10 ways you can stand for Student Press Freedom. That'll be there shortly. First, I'd like to thank a few people for helping make this happen. Danielle Dietrich, Hillary Davis, Hadar Harris, Alexis Mason, and our special guests, Adriana Lacey and Mike Easton. Being a student journalist and an advocate on social media isn't always as straightforward as we would like for it to be. However, student journalists are standing up and challenging the outdated notion that to be a good reporter, you must not disclose how your experiences are impacted by a story. To fight for student press freedom, you as a student journalist are a part of the stories that must be told and you should be able to tell your story. Today we'll explore ways you can be an advocate on social media for causes that you care about and how to stay safe while doing so. We'll also save time for a Q&A session with our guests. And I encourage you to prepare questions for our speakers throughout their presentations and save them for Q the Q&A portion of our program. Before I introduce the speaker, just a couple of housekeeping notes. I encourage you to turn on your cameras if you are comfortable doing so, but if you would like to remain off camera, that is also totally fine. Please remain muted through the presentation though. If you need to reach us during the presentation, please use the chat feature of Zoom and one of us will answer your questions. The pre this presentation is being recorded and a recording will be made available on SPLC's YouTube channel and at www.studentpressfreedom.org. Our first presenter is Adriana Lacey. Adriana is a digital and audience engagement editor at the Neiman Foundation for Journalism at Harvard University, a freelance audience consultant and an adjunct lecturer in the Annenberg School of Communication and Journalism at the University of Southern California. In addition, Adriana is the founder of Journalism Mentors, a website dedicated to advancing early career journalists through mentoring and paid media opportunities. She also writes a newsletter called The Intersection, which focuses on the intersections of journalism, tech, and product. Previously, she worked as a senior associate for audience and growth at Axios and audience engagement editor at the Los Angeles Times and the senior news assistant at the New York Times. We are absolutely thrilled to have her join us today. And Adriana, the floor is yours. Awesome. Thank you so much, Andrew. Um, it's so exciting to be here and, and speak to you all. Um, you know, I so much of my career. Um, has really just happened because I was a student journalist and it's something that I feel really passionate about. Um, I myself um, was the editor-in-chief of a student media outlet. Um, I started my undergrad at Penn State University where I founded a student group called um, The Underground and we covered, you know, these untold stories on our campus and we were really passionate about just, you know, speaking our truth and letting kind of, you know, these untold stories be known. So, so exciting to be with you all, be with student journalists, because I know for so many of us in the industry now, we pretty much, you know, learned everything that we need to know about journalism during our undergraduate years. So it's so exciting to talk to you all. Um, today, I'm going to really just talk about how to really use social media as a journalist and as an advocate. Um, I think what we're seeing right now with the influence of social media is that it's so important to really, you know, advocate for causes that you believe in, whether that's press freedom or that's just some sort of, you know, organization or just, you know, thing that you're really pa passionate about. And it's so important to be able to kind of use these platforms, but also be smart about it so that you can really have, you know, the most maximum impact. So I'm just going to kind of walk through some examples of where we've seen journalists today using social media kind of as this tool for advocacy and also kind of share with you all some ideas that you can do to also advocate on causes that you believe in. So I kind of want to um, really just frame the story by just sending you kind of this real life example of, you know, what happens when journalists are part of the story. 
here's some um, tweets and a headline from the Los Angeles Times, um, a story that was written by Brian De Los Santos. Um, Brian is the editor in chief right now of LAist, which is a um, media company, digital website founded in Los Angeles, where they kind of just cover breaking news and trends happening in LA. And what's interesting about Brian is that Brian's been really outspoken about DACA right now because he was a DACA recipient and, you know, immigration just reform and immigration laws are really important to him. And instead of just kind of, you know, being quiet about it, he's been very vocal and very outspoken about just really, you know, making sure that people know that, you know, this cause is important, there are people suffering and we need to amplify this. Um, he wrote kind of a perspective piece from the LA Times about how, you know, he found out you know, he was undocumented and what that looks like. And now, you know, he's doing more and more of this, just talking about it. And what this really is, is a shift from, you know, the prior days of journalism. For so long, we've always been taught, you know, we can't have advocate for things that we believe and we should be extremely neutral and now we're starting to see that when journalists are part of a story and when they bring their perspective to it the stories can only get better because these are lived experiences and these are things that these journalists have experienced and a really great way to look at this um it's really just kind of figuring out, you know, how do we make this change and how do we do this ethically and how do we make sure that, you know, we're doing strong style of reporting, but we're also bringing solutions and we're also bringing kind of, you know, this change. And what we're seeing is, you know, so many people have really felt passionate about what's happening in society and they really want to speak out. Um, this is an article right here from Time where we had a bunch of journalists reflect on kind of a year of covering their communities. Um, a lot of these stories from last summer and the summer before that when we saw, you know, so many racial protests happening and people just really being outspoken about what's happening. And um, kind of a paragraph from the story is life's pretty much saying, you know, lived experiences can help a reporter empathize and deepen their work with service of telling stories that accurately reflect the world. And it's just an example example of really just how you can do that. And here's kind of just like a quick little look at one of the people who was featured in this time piece. Um, Nadia is an editorial producer, recently out of college and kind of, you know, she had the opportunity to help with Time's coverage of George Floyd and a lot of the protests. And pretty much, you know, what she was reflecting on is this idea that small actions, you know, compound and regardless of kind of, you know, who you are, you have a voice and you can really make things be known. And she's kind of starting to see that when she's spoken out and she's really spoken out on causes that she believes in, she's been given these opportunities and she's been able to really help launch projects and she's been vocal about it. And I think this is an example of how you can be an editorial producer or an entry level person at your, you know, your internship, at your student media outlet, at your first job outside of college, you can still have a voice. And it's just so important to be passionate and be confident in your perspective and use your voice because that voice is so important. I look at journalism right now, you know, people are really wanting that youth voice, you know, the youth are the future subscribers for these media companies. There's the future of, you know, our democracy. And it's so important to make sure that youth are really feeling passionate and really able to kind of advocate on what they believe in. So the biggest way is, you know, you're a student journalist, you're probably wondering, well, how can I advocate for what I believe in? How can I really do what needs to be done? And I think a really great way to advocate through journalism is to look for a solution. So um, the way that you can kind of do that is, I wanted to talk a little bit about Solutions Journalism, which is an organization that really kind of helps journalism organizations really think about how, instead of just reporting on what's happening, they can offer a solution. So for example, maybe you live in a city that has a lot of homelessness, and instead of just writing, you know, this is a problem, maybe we take our journalism a step further and we start exploring the solutions that can exist and interrogate them and see if they will work or if they won't work and why. And um, here's kind of an example of how that was done. Um, at the Santa Fe Reporter, they kind of pushed their city to address homelessness by publishing a bunch of solutions of how they could do it. And a lot of that reporting turned into future policy decisions. So this is an example of how you can use your journalism to really take it to the next step and really start to think about, you know, what's next.
So when you're doing that, it's like, you know, how do I even start about solutions journalism? How do I even get there? And these are kind of four steps from the solutions journalism organization that they offer to really help you do that. Um, number one, just thinking about, you know, we're looking at responses to social problems. Why has it worked? Why hasn't? What kind of things on campus are you passionate about that you'd love to see changed? Why hasn't it changed? What's the history there? That's kind of a great place to start. And then just making sure that you offer insight, you know, things need to be relevant, things need to make sense for organizations, and that's really vital. And then just making sure that you're finding evidence, you know, it's one thing to say, we should fix homelessness by buying everyone a home. And, you know, like, that's a great idea, but like, what's the evidence? What's the data that shows us? What are the, what are the kind of data points you can use? What's been done before? What hasn't been done? Is this response good? Well, why is it good? What are the benefits? What are the downfalls? These are ways you can really start to kind of get closer to that solutions journalism. And then kind of talk about the responses shortcomings. Like I said before, some things may work, some things don't work. And that doesn't mean that it's not newsworthy, but it's important to mention because if you're open about all the different solutions, you kind of just have more and more ways to do that. And it's just important to remember, like this says, you know, it's important to cover what works and what doesn't work, give that content and, you know, report on those limitations. So these are kind of ways that you can start advocating for causes you believe in and things that you want on campus by following these steps. And then there's kind of this idea of, well, how do we translate that to online? Because it's like, you may have, you know, a story that you've written that kind of follows these steps. So you may have something that you're doing and you want to know, how can I actually be safe while I'm doing that? Um, these are kind of just five tips that I've thought of that are really just essential to making sure that you're staying safe online while advocating. You know, one thing about social media is that everyone's on it. You can be anonymous, you can be, you know, someone who no one ever knows and that means that people you know say a lot of mean things when they're not public and people don't know who they are so the first thing I think it's just important to protect your account you know digital safety is really really important um when I say protect your accounts I don't necessarily mean that you need to be on private or anything like that but it's more like you know what security measures do you have on your account you know a lot of times in student media we have so many different passwords for the main you know student media account the sports account the music account there's so many different passwords being you know just passed around by so many different people so making sure that you have all your passwords together only certain people are having access who need access, making sure you have like protections, like two-factor authentication. These things are really important so that yourself and your media organizations can stay safe. Um, I remember when I was an undergrad that one of the student media campuses um, organizations got hacked on Twitter. And a lot of that reason was because they didn't have that two factor and it was really hard for them to regain their account. So just making sure that you're really focused on that is really important. And the second thing is something I think is something that we're starting to see more organizations do is kind of making a plan for harassment, you know. What happens if you write a polarizing story on campus and people start attacking a reporter or an editor for a story, you know, what plans do you have? Considering making a plan of action is a really great way to do that by doing having some sort of plan that happens when someone, you know, gets attacked or what the response is. Those are things to think about. And then also just staying up to date with the latest privacy decisions. Um, anyone who kind of goes on social media, you'll see that they're adding new privacy situations all the time. You know, Twitter's really expanded its um, kind of safety and protection. So those are things to look at. Um, Facebook recently started adding more protection on their Facebook accounts for journalists. So these are things to look into and just making sure that you know what the safety and privacy policies are for these organizations. And when you do all of that, it's important to be vocal about it. You know, a lot of times it's important that, you know, we have a cause and we want to share it and make sure we're loud about that on social media. There's so many different tools and things you can use to really just amplify what you believe in. You know, you don't have to just write a tweet or write a Facebook status. You can do an Instagram live. You can do a Twitter space, you can do an Instagram story. There's so many tools that are just out there for your disposal to really just amplify and let your voice be known. And then lastly, it's so important to follow up on the progress that you've made. Um, I've seen so many student media just, 
you know, break stories that have changed policy decisions that have just impacted the day to day for students. And a lot of times they don't brag about that, you know, it's important to share about these policy decisions, you know, is there a policy or an issue on campus that your student organization has covered and now it has changed, you know, if those policy things are being changed, it's important to write about it, write about the power of your journalism and how that's shaped things. Um, it's really important to know and it's great to let your audience know that you're making a difference. And that's my presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Adriana. And you know, just one thing that Adriana spoke about in her presentation there was solutions journalism. And one solution for ensuring student press freedom is through the establishment of state-based laws. New Voices is a student powered movement working to pass these laws across the country and these laws will codify student press freedom protecting and restoring student journalists right to publish truthfully and freely. You can learn more about it at splc.org slash new voices and contact Hillary Davis at the student press law center to learn how you can get involved. I'm just gonna give a quick reminder that we'll answer questions within our Q&A portion of the program and you can feel free to begin dropping those within the chat. Next, SPLC Senior Legal Counsel Mike Easton will join us to talk about a Supreme Court case that was argued last summer in BLV Mahanoy. A student took to Snapchat to voice her frustration with the cheer team at our high school and she was off campus at a convenience store in the parking lot at the time, but she still faced repercussions from the school. See, this case is important for student journalists to, since today, more and more content is being published and posted while off campus. Mike Easton has been an integral part to S of SPLC success since 1989. He was an SPLC intern, its first legal fellow, and then served as a full-time attorney from 1991 to 2003. Over the years, he's assisted with over 18,000 student journalists and advisors. As the SPLC senior legal counsel, he currently works from the West Coast on the SPLC's hot legal, free legal hotline and on related projects. Mike, the floor is yours. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thanks for, for inviting me here today. And uh, Adriana, um, I mean, we've been talking about these new speech tools for a long, long time. There's just a, a lot of excitement and, and uh, it's it's good to learn a bit more about how to use them uh, effectively. Uh, so I'm going to I'm here to talk about how to use them legally. And I, I will say it was it was nice of the Supreme Court uh, to hand down a decision um, just this summer, uh, just as these new speech tools are, are coming online and students are really using are learning to use them, um, you know, effectively. Uh, the Supreme Court made clear that that we are protected. Um, students are protected, actually, when they when they uh, engage in online uh, speech off campus. So uh, we're going to talk about a little bit about that today, about the Supreme Court decision. I have a little presentation I'll give here. Um, but I do encourage, uh, oops, can, can you see the presentation screen there? Okay, cool. Um, uh, but I do encourage, we're, we're going to talk about kind of, you know, what the, the censorship laws are with respect to, to online speech and the First Amendment protections that are available. Uh, but if you have other legal questions about how to use these uh, these online speech tools, how to use social media effectively uh, and safely, I'm happy to, to talk about that as well. So yeah, please do uh, drop your questions into the chat room. Um, so yeah, so this, this case came down um, this summer. Um, we weren't real sure how it was going to go, but I will give be a spoiler alert, alert uh, the student won. Um, but I think it's important in order to get to uh, the Mahanoy decision, just to kind of to figure out, see how it kind of fits into the whole line of, of student press cases that are that are out there. Um, hold on just a second here, I'm sorry. I'm having a Trouble, trouble seeing my. There we go. Okay. So um, the the very first time the Supreme Court actually heard, a, you know, addressed the question of the, the students have any sort of First Amendment protection on campus was back in the 1940s. Uh, there was a Supreme Court case involving uh, some Jehovah Witness students, and they said that they didn't want to stand uh, to pledge allegiance to the flag. They said that was against their religion, um, and the Supreme Court got involved. And 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 you know, it's a very tangential, short sort of fringe. Uh, uh, 
uh, issue. Uh, but they did say they didn't say it as clearly as would have we would have liked. But they did say at that time that you know that students do have at least some sort of First Amendment protection because they said that students did not have to stand to to pledge allegiance to the flag back then. Um, and that was the law um, for about 20, 25 more years until really the Supreme Court had it teed up for them. The, the question was um, in the Tinker case, which many of you have probably heard about before, but the question was, you know, when students do go to school, um, when they're on campus, are they protected by the First Amendment? Um, many of you have probably we already talked about this in your class, but the case involved um, the Tinker, uh, the Tinker family and some other their classmates that they decided to wear a black armband to school to protest the Vietnam War. Um, they were suspended uh, because uh, they wore this this armband to school. And get, keep in mind, this is 1965, so I mean the Vietnam War is really heating up. I mean it is it's a it's a topic that's becoming front and center. Uh, it's the the lead story. It's becoming the lead story on American um, news every day. Um, but at the time, um, school officials in Des Moines, Iowa, said that the Tinkers and their classmates didn't have the right to wear a black armband, just a simple black armband to school. Uh, to, to voice their opposition to what was going on there. So they take the case all the way to the Supreme Court. Uh, the Supreme Court did, like I said, it was, it was the, the question was, are students protected when they are in school? Does the First Amendment cover them? Um, and the Supreme Court said, um, said uh, loudly that yes, in fact, uh, they are protected. Students don't shed their First Amendment rights when they are in school. Um, that that uh, while they, it's, not a, it's not kind of an unlimited license to say whatever they wanted, uh, the bar was pretty high. Basically, they said that students, um, when they're in school, uh, and this is both the high school and college level, uh, students have the right to express themselves uh, as long as they don't engage in unlawful speech. Um, so libel or copyright or obscenity, those sorts of things. Um, and as long as their speech doesn't create a serious uh physical disruption of normal school activities. So basically, uh, substantial and material disruption was the language they used, but it requires that uh, in order for school officials to censor the speech, they have to show that that speech is going to create uh, havoc that doesn't allow, you know, classes to continue or just, again, just normal school activities uh, to proceed as normal. It's a fairly high bar. I mean, we're not talking here about, uh, you know, if you write something in the school paper, if it just causes some embarrassment or some hurt feelings or something like that. That's not enough. It really does need to, you know, need to rise to the level of, you know, fist fights or, or class walkouts or something uh, so disruptive that that yet yeah, again normal school activities uh, can't continue. So that was the Tinker case, and it really was. It, it was a it was a, a landmark case. It's, it's always described as a landmark case uh, since that time, and the, the case was actually handed down in 1969. So four years uh, after uh, you know the events took place. Uh, um, in Iowa there. Um, but it's been cited like 6,000 times or something like that by courts all over the country. And anytime, anytime a case comes up that involves student free expression rights, you know, you're going to see Tinker cited probably in the first, um, you know, in the first paragraph or so. Tinker was the law, and it actually, it's, it's still good law. Uh, Tinker, uh, but what Tinker was pretty much the only case on the books uh, for about 20 20 years. Um, and in the 1980s, though, the Supreme Court started to have, I think, you know, what you can only kind of describe as cold feet. Uh, they started to kind of cut back on some of those protections uh, that were provided by, by the Tinker case. The first time uh, they cut back on some of those protections was in a case uh, actually just down the road for me. I'm out here in Washington State. This was a, a school just outside Seattle uh, where uh, Matthew Frazier um, was giving a, a a speech in support of one of his friends who was running for student body president. Um, and in the speech, he used some, you know, uh, sexual innuendo, I guess is, is kind of the best way to describe it. Um, you know, the Supreme Court had a hard time describing it. They called it, you know, profane speech and, and um, you know, inappropriate speech and, and uh, you know, all sorts of things. They, they but they, they didn't like it. And basically they said that, that school, school officials have the right to stop students when they are in school again. Um, and that was a big part of this decision. Once they, when they're in school, school officials have the right to stop students from engaging in, in lewd, indecent, plainly offensive sort of speech. Basically, sex talk um, is what the court was seemed to have a big uh, you know, hang up with. Um, so you have 
Tinker. Tinker says, you know, you can't engage in unlawful speech. You can't engage in speech that creates that serious physical disruption. And you also now can't engage in speech that is profane, lewd, indecent, plainly offensive, that sort of thing. So, um, so that was 1985. A couple of years later, in 1988, uh, a case that all the student journalists on here probably heard about the, the, the Hazelwood case. Uh, this case specifically involved, you know, what sort of rights do students working on a school-sponsored student newspaper have? And this is where this question of, of you know, kind of school speech versus non-school speech was really raised for the first time um, in, in, in a, in a, in a you know, explicit sort of way. Uh, the Hazelwood, the, the newspaper Hazelwood East was called the Spectrum, and it was definitely part of it. It was it was school sponsored. It was part of a class and advisor. Uh, the school paid part of the printing bill, um, and so the the Supreme Court said um, that you know because this is a different type of speech from Mary Beth Tinker's armband. This was school sponsored speech. Uh, the Tinker's armbands were non school sponsored speech. They said because different types of speech, you know, a different category of speech, uh, it's appropriate to have a different legal standard. And so what the Supreme Court said was that for school-sponsored speech, uh, school officials could censor it where they had a reasonable educational justification for doing that. Um, unfortunately, the, some of the, they gave some examples in, the, in their decision um, of what would constitute that reasonable educational justification. Um, and the examples were as, as vague as the standard itself. I mean, they said school officials could censor speech that was, quote, poorly written, uh, inappropriate for a particular age audience, um, ungrammatical. They could also censor, censor speech that was inconsistent with the shared values of a civilized social order. I mean, just all over the place, just crazy broad. Um, and it really did do some serious damage to, to, to student media, to American student media. We've seen, uh, I mean, calls to, to us here at the Student Press Law Center soared. Um, and we've seen all sorts of havoc uh, as a result of the Hazelwood decision. One good part of the Hazelwood decision um, that has come out, and Andrew mentioned that a little bit, uh, was this advent of new voice legislation. Um, new voices was a direct attempt. Initially, these, these new voices laws were actually called anti-Hazelwood laws because they are specifically in place to combat Hazelwood, to basically turn back the clock to give students uh, much the same sort of legal protections that they had uh, prior to the Hazelwood decisions coming out. So basically, tinker sort of protection. Um, uh, again, this was all in the context, though, of school-sponsored speech. Um, and, and one of the things that, that we saw, I mean, one of the, the results of Hazelwood was because of the, the, you know, the sort of increased authority uh, that the Supreme Court gave to most school officials, we saw lots of students go to underground newspapers to, to independent sort of media. Now, this was 1988 when the case came out, so there was no internet back then. I mean, it was still all print-based, but we saw lots of, uh, you know, flyers being, uh, you know, uh, produced at home and reproduced at Kinko's and, and handed out in school and how did I hand it out outside of school? Um, because that was one of the things, that was one of the options that students had. Again, Hazelwood only applies, uh, the court said, to school-sponsored speech. Um, a few years later, in 2007, actually many years later, in 2007, um, the Supreme Court um, heard its its last case up until this Mahanoy case came down this year. Um, this case called the Bong, it's popularly known kind of as the Bong Hits for Jesus case. Uh, it involved, and that's what it was. It was there was a banner. You can see it there. This was a banner that was uh, unfurled across from a high school in Juneau, Alaska. Uh, the the Olympic torch was running through Juneau, Alaska, and the students there knew that there'd be TV cameras. And so uh, Joseph Frederick, uh, who was a little bit of a troublemaker, uh, just kind of like to stir things up. He thought he saw this uh, banner. It was on, he, he got it's taken from a bumper sticker <laughs> that he actually saw at one of the local ski resorts. Uh, when asked, you know, what does it mean? He says, I don't know. Um, it, but he knew it would get some, he, he knew it would rile things up and he knew it would get some coverage. And so, and it did. Uh, the principal saw the, the, the banner uh, being unfurled uh, as, the, as the Olympic torch went uh, by and the principal goes across the street. So again, 
this is off campus. This is taking place on a public sidewalk across the street from the school. Principal crosses the street though, rips down the banner, calls Joseph Frederick into the office, suspends him for five days until Joseph cites Thomas Jefferson, then the suspension goes up to 10 days. Um, but this goes to the Supreme Court as well. And one of the big questions was, okay, this, uh, this banner is off campus. It's a, you know, this is not school sponsored speech like the, like the Hazelwood newspaper. This is, this is more like we would think more like you know Mary Beth Tinker's armbands. Uh, the Supreme Court, however, rejected that claim. They said that this was a part of a school-sanctioned activity. That you know students had been released to watch the torch go past, and students uh, were being supervised at least in informally by teachers and stuff. And they said that school sanctioned activity was enough to get it into, uh, to get it out of the, the, the tinker category really, um, and put it into a place where that could be more, uh, uh, could be more regulated. Basically what the court said is that schools, um, in addition to preventing students from engaging in unlawful speech, disruptive speech, uh, inappropriate speech, um, or when they're working on school sponsored uh, newspapers, um, you know, speech that, that, that there's some reasonable educational justification for censoring it. They also said school officials could censor speech uh, that, ex that, that advocated illegal uh, drug use. Um, how this particular ban did that, I'm not sure, but that's what the court said. So that was kind of, that was the law um, up until this past summer um, when the Supreme Court got hold of the very latest case. In this case, so, so the, the question was, I mean, it had always been there. So what sort of protection do students have when they're outside of school? I mean, that question had really never been conclusively answered. We thought we had a pretty good answer, you know, that, that, that you know, that Mary Beth's uh, armband, had she done the arm, you know, wore the armband outside of school, I think everybody kind of agreed that she would not have been pro, uh, you know, school officials wouldn't have been able to punish her. Um, but one of the things we've seen was with the advent of, of social media, those boundaries between kind of, you know, the geographic boundaries between in school and out of school uh, have really been blurred. Um, and, you know, when you are posting something, even though if you're posting it from your, your Twitter account at midnight from your own bedroom, I mean, that, that Twitter message, that tweet is going to come on school grounds probably. Um, and so the court was faced with this question. You know, I mean, are we going to recognize this really clear, you know, physical geographic boundary between in school speech and out of school speech, or are we going to give school officials a little bit more authority to control uh, what takes place out of school. Um, well, fortunately, so so the cases, uh, the, the, the uh, facts of the case are fairly simple. Andrew kind of mentioned them, but, but um, uh, Brandy Levy uh, was a freshman in high school. Uh, Mahanoy is a school, high school up in, uh, in Pennsylvania. Um, she was on the, the freshman JV cheerleading team and tried out for the varsity team at the end of her freshman year, um, and she didn't make it. And so she found out the news apparently when she was outside of school, it was a Saturday. Um, she was in like a 7 a convenience store parking lot um, when she, she decided she just kind of had enough. And so she tweeted out to her, to her closed group of friends. So this was a, you know, this was a Snapchat uh, that went to a closed uh, group. It was a, it was a private group. I think about 250 different uh, of her classmates were on it. Um, but she, tweets out this thing that basically just says F chair. She uses the actual word F chair, um, F softball, F, F everything basically is what she says. Um, that tweet um, is actually, so it goes out to her, her, her friends. Uh, one of those friends apparently shared it with one of her teammates on the cheerleading team who shared it with the cheerleading coach. Uh, the cheerleading coach decided that was just inappropriate that that um you know even though she was off campus uh that that they had rules that that's that, that cheerleaders were supposed to kind of adhere to and and act civilly and appropriately uh and she felt that this violated those rules and so she suspended brandy levy uh wouldn't let her participate in any sort of school activities for a year um the case went up to the supreme court um, and the big question was, you know, the, the, you know, was, uh, did Tinker cover this? Did, you know, did Tinker uh, protect speech, uh, student speech off campus? And by an eight to one ruling, um, the Supreme Court ruled for Brandy Levy. Uh, this is, this is huge for, for us as student journalists, just in the sense that 
provides a really clear safe harbor for us. I mean, we weren't, you know, there was some question about, you know, when we're off campus, when we are outside of school, you know, what sort of control do school officials actually have? And, and by an A to one ruling, uh, the court limited that. I mean, they didn't do it quite as clearly as we would have hoped they would have done, uh, but they did make clear, uh, you know, that at least for purposes of the sort of activity that we're talking about here, you know, sort of bona fide journalism, you know, bona fide advocacy, that sort of thing, um, that, that, that school officials really have very little authority over it. Um, basically, um, the court said that uh, Justice Breyer was the one that, that, that uh, wrote the opinion um, and basically said is that, you know, again, schools have less interest in policing off campus social media. Uh, the first reason he gave is that basically when students are off campus, you know, you're your parents problem. Um, you're not the problem the principal really ought not to be, you know, regulating what you do from your bedroom on a Saturday night at midnight. Um, you know, that is is if you're doing something you shouldn't be, that's your parents' problem. If you're doing something you really shouldn't be, you know, maybe that's the police's problem or something like that. But it really shouldn't be, uh, in most cases, it shouldn't be the, 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 the uh, you know, the realm of the, the of school officials uh, to, you know, to, to have to regulate that stuff, sort of thing or punish you. Um, uh, basically, they said that, uh, you know, we need to be very mindful that, that social media is the way that we connect these days. Social media is simply the way that, that students talk, that young people talk, um, and that we need to be re, we need to respect that. The other thing they said is that you know social media um, is is speech. It's a way that 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 we you know as young citizens uh, engage, and um, we need to. You know, part of a part of what you do when you go to school is you learn civics. You learn, you know, why you know, First Amendment is important. Why, you know, uh, free speech uh, in a free society is is kind of its lifeblood. And so, um, you know, one of the things that, that Breyer said is that America's public schools are the nurseries of democracy, which is a which is a wonderful line. But again, um, they didn't. It wasn't a slam dunk. They didn't say students have full authority to, you know, full rights to say whatever they want, uh, where you are engaged in, he mentioned some specific things like cyberbullying, uh, harassment, something called true threats, if you're calling in bomb threats or something to the school, um, breaches of school security. There are certain times, um, but, but limited number where school officials still do have the right to regulate off-campus speech. Um, but 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 um, in most cases, and, and especially in cases where you are engaged in bona fide advocacy, bona fide journalism, um, you're going to be protected. So I think that's basically the the stuff that I wanted to say, Andrew. So um, I'm, I'm like I said, I'm, I know that there's lots more questions about using social media um, beyond you know just what your rights are when you're off campus to do it. So I'm happy to get into any of those if you'd like. Most definitely. All right. Well, thank you so much, Mike. And for those of you working for toward earning the Student Press Freedom Badge on LinkedIn, your code word for this workshop is pinned tweet. I couldn't think of anything else more appropriate. That's just what it's going to be. Um, but if you are on Zoom with us live, just go ahead and head over to SPLC's Twitter feed, which is at SPLC and Go ahead and retweet our pin tweet, which will give your followers a little bit more information about some of our Student Press Freedom Day offerings. Now, Student Press Freedom Day, it is a day that is for you, student journalists, to raise awareness of your challenges, uplift your successes, and show the world why student journalism is important. On February 24th, join us to advocate for student press freedom. Before we dive into the Q&A portion, though, I'd like to recognize a few people who are on the call that been instrumental in passing some, in or advancing some of those new voices laws that I mentioned earlier. New Jersey passed new voices late in 2021 in December. Todd McHale helped drive that effort forward and Cindy Reeves is pushing things forward in Hawaii today. Max Forenstein is moving the needle in Florida. In fact, many of you on this call right now are passionate and dedicated advocates for new voices and we're excited to have you here. Thank you all for your support and for joining us. Now we'll open up the call to your questions. If you have a question, just feel free to send me a message in the chat and I'll call on you to ask it. If you don't want to ask it on the call, just send me the question and I'm, I'll answer it, I'll, send, but I'll ask it for you. Uh, we'll start with Adriana, our first presenter. Um, can you just tell us a little bit about why student press freedom is important to you? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think for me, I kind of, 
grew up, you know, like I said, I started in student media and I was in a um, independent media outlet. So we weren't funded by our university. And for us, you know, a lot of the work that we did was to really just, you know, give voices to the voiceless. And I think without, you know, the protections that are in place for, you know, press freedom, like we wouldn't have been able to cover the stories that really, you know, impacted and really affected students. So I think for me, like just having the freedom to really just, you know, spotlight and advocate for causes and people is really the reason. And can you describe a time when you were an advocate for a cause on social media and what did you do to make it particularly effective? Yeah, for sure. Um, I think for me, a cause that I've been really ad um, just advocating with with journalism is kind of, you know, this call for the industry itself to just become more diverse and become more inclusive. And I think a lot of it's been sharing stories, uplifting people who may not, you know, have, you know, the means to share about why this diversity and inclusion is important to them. So I think for me, like, you know, I try to retweet as many people as I can. I try to amplify as many voices as I can on social media and making sure that, you know, people are aware of what's happening. I love, you know, doing Twitter threads and sharing the stories and really getting my voice known. So you mentioned kind of raising voice, like elevating voices and sharing. Um, well, so do you have to have a large following to be an advocate online? Not at all. I mean, I feel like some of my most, you know, just advocacy days were when I was an undergrad and I didn't have a ton of followers, but I think for me, I had the passion and I had the desire to make a difference. And I think that's really where it starts. Awesome. And we have a question here from uh, attendees here in the chat. How do journalists maintain their credibility and when objectivity reporting on controversial topics when they are known to also express opinions through other pieces of work? I can reread that one because I butchered that. Um, how do journalists maintain their credibility when, objective, when objectively reporting on controversial topics when they are known to also express opinions through other pieces of work? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I think I would just start by, you know, no one's completely objective. I think all of us have backgrounds and biases that we, you know, consciously or subconsciously bring to every story that we report. And I think it's important to remember that. Um, I think for me, as a journalist and as a person, I'm focusing less on this idea of objectivity and more on this idea of fairness and equity. You know, are we, are we being fair to people? You know, are we covering both sides of an issue, not necessarily, you know, giving both sides the same credibility and the same weight, but are we at least doing our due diligence? And I think for me, I just try to make sure that, you know, we're being fair on things and, you know, we're really just making sure that we're doing our due diligence. And I think honestly, the journalism will really just speak for itself. And Mike, if someone runs into some trouble when trying to be an advocate online, what can they do to, for, to seek support? You know, it. Um, I guess it kind of depends on what the what the trouble is. Um, uh, but you know, one of the things I am seeing um, that Adriana mentioned before, uh, Adriana mentioned before, uh, was uh, is the online harassment. I mean, definitely as we're seeing, you know, more and more. Uh, students uh, go online using social media uh, to, to either do the reporting or to, to do some of this advocacy that we're talking about. Um, we are seeing, uh, you know, some pretty nasty stuff come back at them. Um, I'm going to put in the, because I wanted to do this earlier, but uh, there's a really good uh, uh, online resource that I share with uh, folks that call me up when they're Give me some some you know examples or some instances of harassment. The but Pin has put out a an online field manual uh, or a field manual for online harassment that gives some you know just again some some good uh, beforehand sort of suggestions regarding things to do. Uh, just digitally um, setting up digital safety and that sort of thing, but also, you know, what to do um, and when to actually, you know, seek out and get additional help. When might police get involved? When might uh, you actually reach that level where you need to, you know, bring in some extra help? And let's shift things a little bit over to the, as the post uh, school world here. Uh, Adriana, can you talk about how online advocacy is treated within professional newsrooms today? That's a great question. Um, I think it really varies. You know, I think we're seeing newsrooms just grapple with that. I mean, I think everyone's having that conversation, you know, like what does that look like for, 
for newsrooms. And I think we're starting to see organizations really start to, you know, be more intentional about policies and social media policies around that. Um, when I worked at the LA Times, I was on a committee where we were actually tasked with that same thing of kind of, you know, what are social media policies? What can you advocate for? What can't you advocate for? And something that we came up with is, you know, um, social justice issues, issues around human rights were things that everyone could agree on that we could kind of rally around and advocate on. Whereas with, you know, some political things were a bit more murky. So I think it's one of those things where it's, it's a problem that everyone's thinking about and everyone's trying to be intentional about. But I do think that a lot of organizations have figured out, you know, like there are some things that, you know, transcend the politics and like the human right things, like I said before. So I think it's, it's an important conversation to have and I'm happy that more newsrooms are being a lot more intentional about it. So should early career journalists be afraid that their careers may be harmed if they advocate for student press freedom on their social media accounts? Yeah, I mean, I would say no. Um, I think just press freedom in general is something that the entire industry is aware of. I mean, I think just these past years, we've seen a lot of, you know, threats to press freedom, both abroad, but also domestically. And I think that that's a really big issue that a lot of newsrooms are starting to confront. So I think that it's kind of universally agreed upon that, you know, these are important tenets of our democracy and defending that is a, definitely a worthy cause. Awesome. And I'm just going to go ahead and remind everyone, if you have a question, uh, feel free to go ahead and raise your hand in the chat here. Just shoot me a quick message saying, hey, I have a question and um, you'll be free to ask. Um, but yeah, um, so just Mike, coming back over to you, you um, operate our at, at SPLC, our free legal hotline, and you speak with student journalists every day about these type about these type of issues. Um, what are a few things that you feel that student journalists should keep in mind when they go to be an advocate online? Uh well, hopefully, you know, uh, you've learned a bit either in your uh, journalism class or media law class or anything like that. You've learned some of the basic sort of rules that we have to follow, you know, um, when we're engaged in any sort of journalism, print journalism or otherwise, uh, you know, things about libel and copyright and that sort of thing. Um, it's important to remember that those same rules, even though we're talking about, you know, a hundred character tweet or something like that. I mean, a tweet can be libelous. A tweet certainly can include uh, material that, that violates somebody's copyright. So, so again, coming at it from the, the legal perspective, you know, just make sure that you're, you're mindful of all the old rules that you're not just flushing them out and saying, you know, this is just a, you know, an informal tweet or something like that. I don't really have to worry about uh, the old copyright rules. Um, but boy, you know, when the minute you start forgetting the, some of those things, I mean, that's when um, your enemies, the people and perhaps on the other side of these issues, um, they can make your life look pretty difficult. So it's important to, you know, keep those basic sort of rules um, in mind. And certainly, you know, if you're running into issues or if you have issues before you're, you know, you're, you're starting a, a social media campaign or something, um, you know, we're happy to help you here at the Student Press Law Center kind of make your way through some of those things. Thank you. And um, we're going to end the Q&A portion here um, with the classic. Um, is there anything else that you'd like to share, Adriana, first and Mike? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I just want to stress how important, you know, the work that you all do is, you know, not only to just, you know, the work for your universities, but also, you know, just for the country and for the world, you know, I mean, I've just been so heartened to see just so many stories lately that student journalists are really kind of at the forefront of. Um, like I said, I work at Harvard. I'm sure you've all kind of been following a lot of the reporting that the Crimson has done kind of around sexual assault allegations um, for a professor on campus. And, you know, the Crimson has been the leading kind of reporting in that. And I think it's just kind of a testament to, you know, student journalists are usually the ones who are on the front lines, the one breaking the news. And, you know, your work is definitely not unnoticed by all of us. I, I just follow that up. I mean, your voices are 
absolutely important um, to to the the discussion right now. I mean, we are in unprecedented times. I mean, and and you all uh, more than certainly me is a you know near sixty year old. I mean, you have so much more at stake than than, than I do, and we need to hear from you. Um, and and social media is 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 one of those tools uh, that that you know provides that platform to to get your message out. Uh, there are others, but certainly uh, there are ways to use it effectively. Ways to use it legally, um, and yeah, we 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 need more of that. We we need you to get involved. We you know, uh, if if you don't toot your horn, nobody else is. Um, you have a unique message, um, and it's important that that you know you share that message. Because if you don't, nobody's going to hear it. Um, and boy, we need to hear those things. Now we we need to hear from you. We need to hear from you and so do the people who are making laws in each and every one of our states because student press freedom is important in all 50 states across the country and in DC. I'm just going to put it out there as a DC resident. But we also have a resource for you to find out what's happening on the ground in your state called our state by state advocacy guide and the link to that is just not been put in the chat. Um, take a look at that and see what's going on in your state um, and see what the status of student press freedom is where you are and thank you all for joining us today this event's the last in our series leading up to student press freedom day and remember you can head over studentpressfreedom.org to explore our other programs and events in my intro i did miss the opportunity to acknowledge dan Fermansky, and dan's been one of the folks working behind the scenes to make student press freedom day happen so thank you for joining us and for your support and before everyone closes their computers for tonight or logs off here, because I did see a few of y'all go ahead and jump early, um, I'm going to give you some homework. Uh, this link that's in the chat right now will give you will take you to our Student Press Freedom Day toolkit, um, which inside of that is a few pre-drafted social media posts. You can begin your advocacy journey on social media just right now today by copying any of these and sharing them with your followers. Feel free to go ahead and check check that out and save that link before we close the presentation and the chat goes away. The Student Press Law Center is here to support you, the student journalists. And if you have been censored or if you've been feeling something just isn't quite right, go to splc.org and click the Get Legal Help button that's at the top of the page. Fill out our legal hotline form or book a time to talk on the phone with one of our legal experts and they will be in touch shortly to answer your questions and provide assistance. You can also find toolkits, presentations, frequently asked questions, and more at splc.org. And if you haven't already, sign up for our newsletter and follow us on social media. Those links will be in the chat. Thank you again for joining us. And remember to unmute yourself for student press freedom. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.